Hello and welcome to our speaker series tonight. My name is Rebecca Gilbert and I am the Associate Director of Education at Trees Atlanta. And we're so excited to welcome you to our speaker series tonight with um, Gabe Anderley from Georgia Audubon, Trees and Birds Rooted Together. And I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome everyone as our participants are logging in and kind of go over just a little bit of housekeeping for the program this evening. So if you will notice down at the bottom of your screen, how you can interact with us tonight. I'll be going over that in just a moment. For those of you that aren't as familiar with Trees Atlanta, our mission is to protect and improve Atlanta's urban forest by planting, conserving, and educating. That's why tonight's program is so important with our partnership that we have with Georgia Audubon, making the connections between different parts of our natural world. So tonight's webinar will be able to have you interacting with our presenter. And that means you have some options to ask questions. So down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A button and there's also a chat feature. Please feel free at any time throughout the presentation to, to list those questions. I'll be gathering those questions and we'll have time at the end to ask those questions and get those answered. If for some reason there are an abundance of questions and we don't get to them all, don't worry, we will get answers for you. Uh, this recording will be coming out uh, in your survey email coming up. And we need your feedback. As, as we're all you know, going through these, these times together, we wanna to make sure we're providing you the content and the format that you want and need. So please, once this program is concluded, you'll receive a survey link. Please complete it, give us some feedback. Let us know how it went, what you would like more of, what you would like less of. And you'll also receive a recording uh, link a little bit later as well. If you aren't already logged into Trees Atlanta's social channels, please do so where you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. And you can also sign up for our newsletters. We send them out throughout the year and you can stay up to date on different events. And with that, I would like to welcome Gabe Anderley. He is the Habitat Program Manager at Georgia Audubon. And we're really excited to welcome him and have him share with you the importance of the, and the relationship between trees and birds. So. Uh, Gabe, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. Good to be here. I'll go ahead and get my screen shared so we can get this presentation rolling. All right. Very excited to be here with you all today, talking about trees and birds, two of my, my favorite subjects. And I wanted to open with this uh, beautiful picture that represents a little bit of the relationship between trees and birds. This is a prothonotary warbler, um, a species of bird that breeds throughout Georgia. And um, it has a special relationship with, with trees because it's a cavity nesting bird. And it's our only cavity nesting warbler in the Eastern US. Uh, so that's a, a pretty unique fact about them. And here it's, it's sitting and singing on a bald cypress stump. So uh, one of our native trees to the, the Southern part of the state and an absolutely amazing tree. All right. So I want to uh, first start by sharing this photo of, of a wildlife sanctuary that's certified by Georgia Audubon. This is um, one of our members' backyards. And uh, I thought it was a really good representation of the Piedmont region of Georgia and, and what most places in the Piedmont kind of historically looked like. And when you look at this photo, at least when I look at it, I see a bunch of green and that, that's what jumps out to me. And um, the green stuff is, is really the most important stuff when it comes to um, what else you're going to see in that space. And so in the Piedmont, you know, the oak hickory forest is, is really a dominant um, habitat type and the major trees that, that drive a lot of our forests and throughout a lot of the eastern US. Um, and so Trees really are the anchor for our ecosystems, and so many of our birds would not be here without trees. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to start just by sharing this because when you go outside, you know, trees are the first thing that you see 
and then all of the plant life underneath the trees, and then the birds are like the ornaments in the trees, and so on and so on. Um, but the trees really do so much, and we're going to dive into that um, a little further. So I wanted to share this graphic because I thought it did a really good job showing um, how a diversity of trees, not only in species, but in structure, is really important in, in allowing there to be a great diversity of wildlife and in particular birds. Uh, and what's special about trees is that obviously when they're seedlings, they're all the way down in the ground cover. And then as they start to grow, they might stop in the understory or midstory or canopy, depending on what species it is. But they play an important role in all of those layers. So one tree might, you know, be a host to so many different bird species throughout their lifetime because there's a lot of our birds that only use specific um, habitat parts throughout their life cycle or um, certain times of year. Um, so there are some birds that will spend a lot of time in the canopy and they might come down to the mid-story to um, nest. Some nest on the ground when they spend a lot of time in the canopy, like we have some warbler species that do that. I mean, so really having layers in your habitat is really valuable and trees do an amazing job of, of providing that and having different species of trees is really important because different species obviously grow at different heights and provide different resources for the birds and for the other wildlife um, that are around. So why do birds need trees? And birds definitely do need trees. At least the large major majority of birds do. There are some, you know, ocean going birds and stuff that you could probably argue might not need them, but our planet definitely needs them. So in a way, all birds need trees. Um, but for the birds that immediately are using trees um, in their everyday life, one, it's a nice place to sit and we'll get into what that what that means. Um, it pro they provide shelter and safety for birds. Who doesn't like a good tree house? Many of our birds nest in trees. Building material for a lot of those nests comes from trees. And food. There are many different um, ways trees provide food for, for birds. And so we'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, here you can see two birds that are native to Georgia. Um, you have the great blue heron flying down on the bottom. And that's a, a bird that spends a lot of time in and around water. Um, and you don't see it as often um, up in a tree, but they use trees that have fallen into the water as a place to sit and preen their feathers and hang out in the sun and hunt. But then here you can see in this photo, they're, they're using those sticks um, from fallen trees to, to build their nests. And so that's a, a great blue heron carrying its nesting material. On the right hand, we have a white-breasted nuthatch, which is a, a really great bird that you can see throughout the year here in Georgia. And, um, it makes a little sound like yank, 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 yank. And uh, so they can be identified pretty easily by sound, but also their movement. They spend a lot of time. They're like the tree huggers of the bird world because they're always on the trunks and some of the larger branches of trees. Um, and they move up and down the trees, um, scooting along. A lot of people mistake them for woodpeckers uh, because they, they spend so much time on the trunks of trees. But that's a, a fun bird to be on the lookout for. And it's a bird that, um, you know, forages for insects on the bark of trees, and it also eats um, seeds as well. So you can get them at your bird feeders if you have bird feeders too. All right, so as I mentioned, trees are a nice place to sit, right? And this is really important for so many birds. So passerines, I don't know if you've heard of the term passerines before, but um, passerines is a, an order of birds, and it's actually the largest order of birds. Um, and so there's, I think it's about 60% of, of birds are passerines. It's about 6,000 species or 6,500 species, I think it is. Um, and passerines are perching birds. So these birds are kind of classified together because they have three toes in front and one toe in back, which um, is, is really great for perching. So all of our, all of these passerine birds, you know, have adapted and evolved to perch. Um, and so really, you know, they've been growing and changing with trees throughout uh, a very long time. Um, and the bird you hear, you see kind of on the left side of the screen on the bottom is an Eastern Phoebe, and that is a passerine. Um, and they spend a lot of time uh, sitting out in the open. Um, and so 
trees provide a place that is, you know, out in the open, it gives you a really good point of view. Um, and it's also a place that is, you know, can be pretty exposed um, and high up. And so it allows birds to uh, sing and it allows their, their um, songs to be projected um, at a distance. So when the males um, get here to Georgia in the spring to breed, if they're migratory or if they're already here, a lot of times they're going to look for a tree that is high up and in an area where they can really project their song. And that's really critical, um, especially in our urban environments, um, in order to uh, recruit a female and have a family. Um, you know, in our urban environments, there's so many sounds that uh, birds are competing with. And so allowing them to find a good place to sing can be important in, in their success. Um, also, some of our birds rely on their amazing plumages um, to show off to uh, a potential um, female. And so having a place where they can sit out in the open and, and show off their, their plumage is also important and trees provide that. Now, fun in the sun or shade. Uh, so, you know, there are places where you can sit out on the top of a tree. There are dead trees. There are trees that have a lot of foliage. So um, all of those options allow birds to um, go from a hot place to a cold place. Um, and this can be really important because birds have feathers and feathers are critical to birds, especially our birds that, that fly and swim. And, um, and so maintaining feathers is, is something that birds do and spend a lot of time doing. And so it's important that they have a good place to do that. Um, a lot of our birds spend time sunning. So on the right side, you can see an anhinga, which is um, often called a snake bird. It has that long neck and it hunts fish. And um, they're native to South Georgia. And occasionally, like this time of year, they can be found sometimes in the Atlanta area. Um, and this is a bird that dives into the water and swims around and catches fish. Uh, and it has to, once it gets out of the water, it has to dry off. And so it's really critical that it has a safe place to perch and dry off. So fallen logs or um, trees are a great place for them to do that. Um, so here you can see it um, perched up in what I think is a, uh, a maple tree, maybe a red maple tree. Um, and it's, yeah, sitting there and they spend a lot of time just sitting there with their wings spread out so they can dry off those feathers in order to be able to fly um, more effectively and uh, decrease their weight. Um, and so that's, that's an important thing for, for that species. Now, um, it's also, trees are also a great lookout point, right? So we're talking about how there's a variety of places within any given tree um, where birds can hang out and um, this, is a, this is a reason why some of our, our dead trees are actually really valuable because um, they allow for a really wide open view for birds to see what's around them. Um, and that is for birds that are, are predators uh, like hawks and owls and even the little eastern phoebe is, is feeding on insects, flying insects. So it needs a nice wide open area where it can sit and perch and um, hunt. Um, and then also, you know, um, you know, trees are, are a place for the birds to, to rest when they're singing or hunting. Um, you know, a lot of our birds um, don't have the energy to just constantly be flying back and forth. And so they need that place to sit. Um, and then also it's a great lookout for prey. So, you know, there's a whole big circle of life, right? And, um, and so there's some animals that are eating others and that includes birds. And so there's a lot of birds that are important um, prey items for a variety of animals from mammals to other birds and um, having options um, in terms of foliage and um, different types of trees allows birds to um, hide if need be. And um, the next thing is, yeah, high up and hidden. So that's kind of what I just touched on. Um, but having those options and having a variety of trees that provide those different options is really important. And that's something that you can emulate in your own backyard. Um, trying to have different sizes of trees to allow for um, different niches to be to be fulfilled with within species. All right, so shelter and safety. This is kind of building off of what we were just talking about with the birds being able to get away um, if they are a, a potential prey item, but also just as you know, part of their daily routine. Um, so many of our birds rest and roost in trees. They sleep in trees. 
not all of our birds, but a lot of them do. And it really is critical for, uh, for their well being. There are so many ground um, predators, you know, and especially here in urban areas, we have um, outdoor cats, which are devastating to birds. And so without having um, places that they can get up in trees and, you know, sit on a branch that a cat can't get to, um, you know, it's, it's really playing an important role in, in their safety when they're going to roost at night. Um, you know, um, yeah, the trees also give birds a place to eat. So, and to feed their young. So a lot of our birds you'll see are gonna catch their prey and they're gonna go up in a tree to eat that food. Um, so that not only gives them safety from other predators, but also from potential insects that are gonna be trying to eat that same food. So a lot of times you'll see a hawk um, or an owl bring their prey up into a tree and eat it there because there are less um, insects that are, they're gonna have to worry about uh, when it comes to trying to eat that same um, food item. And uh, many of our birds nest in trees. Um, so they're gonna be feeding their young up in those nests as well. And that provides some safety too from ground um, predators. Um, and then also bad weather. So that's an important thing, um, especially this time of year when we get some of that hurricane weather and some of those heavy rains. Um, and also in the winter time, it's, it's really critical because you know birds are really high energy um, uh, organisms. They have to constantly be eating. And, and if they go a couple days without food, that can be very, very detrimental. Uh, most birds can't survive um, a couple days without food. And so having places to hide and get away from the bad weather and, and regulate their temperature and keep their feathers dry is, is also really critical for them in terms of maintaining their health um, during, during bad weather. And then mating. Uh, a lot of our birds mate up in the trees. Uh, some birds do mate in flight, but a lot of birds um, need a perch to mate. Uh, and so that's also another important um, resource for the birds when it comes to the trees. And here we have a photo of a, a yellow warbler, a blurry yellow warbler flying into the trees, potentially escaping a predator. Um, so that shows the importance there and also the difficulty of bird photography at some time. And then on the right, we have a beautiful little barred owl, a young barred owl who's um, resting. Um, and barred owls are the most common species of owl we have in the Atlanta area. Um, and so that's a fun one to be on the lookout for. And they are actually pretty common, more common than most people realize. Um, and they are a crepuscular species of owl. And so you can actually see them most active at dawn and dusk. They aren't entirely nocturnal. Um, like some other owl species. All right, so why else do birds need trees? Well, who doesn't like a good tree house? Um, so many of our birds um, nest in trees. Um, we have a lot of species that do nest on the ground, but most of our birds in Georgia, um, especially our pastorines, are, are nesting in trees. And so there are a couple different types of, of nests. Well, actually a lot of different types, but when it comes to trees, you have your two basic ones, which is cavity nesting birds and cup nesting birds. Um, so the cavity nesting bird is a bird that nests inside a dead or a dying tree or a um, tree that has, you know, a rotted out section from uh, fungus or something like that. And um, on the left, you can see um, a tree swallow, which is one of our cavity nesting birds. And, you know, this goes to show some of the importance of, of dead and dying trees once again, um, because they play that critical role for those cavity nesting species like the prothonotary warbler that I was talking about at the very beginning of the presentation. And, um, and then, yeah, you can also see that the um, cup nesting birds are using tree material oftentimes to build the nest on the trees. So the trees are providing support and they're also providing nesting material. Um, and a lot of the cavity nesting birds actually take, you know, nesting material inside those cavities as well to make them more comfortable for themselves and for their young. Uh, so we have the tree swallow, we have American robin in the center, uh, and then on the right we have our bald eagles. And the bald eagles really build massive nests. Their nests can weigh over a thousand pounds and um, they'll reuse that nest uh, multiple years sometimes. Sometimes other birds of prey will come in and use that nest as well, like a a great horned owl could come and use the eagle's nest at times. 
Uh, and some birds rebuild their nest every year. Some birds go back to a nest um, again and again. And so having a lot of trees and a healthy tree population of various sizes, types, and age classes is really critical for supporting a variety of bird species um, throughout the year. Here's another really neat uh, bird in an awesome photo that I wanted to share. And uh, this species of bird is called a brown creeper. And this species overwinters in Georgia. And um, it is really neat because this bird actually nests behind the bark of trees. Uh, so, you know, there are some bat species that will nest or, yeah, roost behind um, the bark, like on a shagbark hickory, for example. And um, these little brown creepers, you know, are a small bird that also nests behind um, pieces of bark. And so having um, trees that have that shaggy bark or trees that are dying and have um, bark that's just hanging off the side of the tree can be really important for providing habitat for this particular species. Um, and this is another bird that's kind of similar to the knot hatch. It's really small. It goes up and down the trunks of the tree looking for insects. Uh, and like I said, it's here in the winter time. It's a, it's a really neat bird to be on the lookout for. All right, food is so critical for birds um, and for everyone. <laughs> um, and when it comes to trees, trees are a major, major, major food source for birds and for, for many reasons. So we're gonna dive into that now. Obviously, a lot of our, our trees produce fruit. Um, and over 70% of bird dispersed fruit ripens in the fall here in, in North America, and Eastern North America. And that is really critical for birds because a lot of our birds are migratory and they rely on that fruit in order to have enough fat reserves to migrate and get to the far off places that they're going. Um, and so um, there are certain native uh, tree species that, that have berries that are pretty high in fat. Um, and that is really what a lot of our migratory birds are looking for um, in the fall. And uh, this is things like dogwood, um, sassafras, um, and a couple other species that have really high fat um, uh, uh, berries and fruit. Uh, Virginia creeper is another uh, species that grows on trees, uh, a vine that has uh, high fat berries too. Um, there's nuts, seeds, nectar, sap, flowers, and buds. Uh, so a lot of our birds eat nuts and seeds, and that's obviously um, uh, seen in, in bird feeders, but having trees that provide those resources is just um, as important. And then nectar, our hummingbirds eat nectar and sap, um, we'll, and we'll feed on that. But there's also other species of birds, like orioles will oca occasionally um, go and look for nectar from trees and, and feed on that. Um, flowers and buds. A lot of times in the spring, it's really important for, for birds to be um, feeding on those buds when all of the uh, winter food is kind of um, really de been depleted. And uh, things like house finches will um, feed on those and other finch species. Uh, and here on this slide, we have a cedar waxwing on a red uh, or a black cherry tree, um, which is an absolutely fantastic tree for a number of reasons when it comes to wildlife. Um, and the cedar waxwing is a bird that's here in the wintertime, uh, and they, they are a bird that likes to hang out in very large flocks, and they have a high-pitched um, call that you can sometimes hear, and sometimes it's so high-pitched that you can barely make it out at all. Uh, but they are heavily frugivorous in the, in the um, wintertime and in the fall when they're looking for um, all kinds of fruit from various tree species to feed on. Then you have the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker on the right, which is one of our seven uh, native woodpecker species. And this is our only migratory woodpecker species. So this, this um, bird is only here in the wintertime as well. Uh, but if you ever are walking out in the woods and you see all those um, horizontal line, uh, holes in the tree that are in a line, um, there's a good chance that it's from a yellow-bellied sapsucker. They um, drill those little wells into the tree and then periodically go back and feed on the sap that's coming out of those. Um, Ruby-throated hummingbirds will also feed from those little sap wells um, that the um, yellow-bellied sapsucker creates on various trees. And uh, 
many of you might be wondering if those holes are, you know, particularly detrimental to the tree's health. And very, very seldom does the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker um, create holes that create problems for the trees. Um, if a tree is healthy, it shouldn't be an issue at all. Uh, and I've definitely seen plenty of trees that are hundreds of year old, years old with uh, active yellow-bellied sapsucker holes on them. But that's another unique bird and tree relationship. All right, so let's uh, now jump to some recommendations uh, that I wanted to share. Uh, both Georgia Audubon and Trees Atlanta have plant sales coming up this fall. Um, and so if you wanna take out your phone and take a picture of the screen, if you're interested in getting some plants, these are some plants that I picked out um, that are available um, and they provide great resources for birds when it comes to fruits, nuts, seeds, nectar, that sort of thing. And you can see the bold and underlined uh, trees are ones that are available at both sales. The green are the Georgia Audubon only. And then all the other ones that are just regular type are, are just at the Trees Atlanta sale. Um, and there's really an awesome variety here. So pawpaw has amazing fruit. Um, it can do well in part shade areas. Redbud, another mid-story. Um, I think the focus for the Trees Atlanta sale this year is trees for small, small yards. And so there's a lot of really great mid-story trees here um, and, and some other really fantastic trees. So yeah, you can take a picture um, of this. And let's see what other trees on this list do I really like. American Beach has the amazing smooth bark. Uh, and is really an iconic tree for, for our music forests here in the Atlanta area. Uh, American black elderberry is kind of a, a shrub tree. I don't know, guys, depends on who you ask, but uh, that's what is pictured here on the slide with the brown thrasher. So you can see all of those great berries for the um, birds to feed on. And this time of year, most of the elderberries have been eaten by a lot of the birds. So if you see elderberry around, a lot of times the um, berries are all gone this time of year, but it's a great, great uh, plant to attract birds. And the brown thrasher is our state bird. Uh, and it is a really neat bird that you can see all throughout the state. And um, it is known for being a mimic. It makes tons and tons of vocalization. So that's something to be on the lookout for and also listening for. Um, service berry has berries that you can eat. Um, and the birds can eat. So that's a fun one. Same thing, American persimmon has delicious fruit and the Chickasaw plum. So really a bunch of great plants. Um, all right, let's keep going. So what other food do uh, trees offer for birds? Well, there's a bunch of food, you know, that is indirectly offered to birds via the, the presence of trees. So vines are the first one that come to mind because a lot of vines really need the trees as a place to climb. Uh, in, our, in our forest where there's a lot of dense shade, uh, the vines have to climb up the trees to get to the top in order to flower and produce fruit. Uh, so some of the ones that are particularly good for birds are cross vine, trumpet vine, Virginia creeper, and poison ivy. Pictured on the right side, you see a hummingbird feeding on a trumpet vine, trumpet vine flower. Uh, they'll also feed on cross vine. Virginia and creeper and poison ivy are really, really critical for birds um, in the fall and winter when they have their berries. A lot of people like to rip out the poison ivy from their yard, but if there's an area where you can keep poison ivy in your yard, it is really, really beneficial to birds and other wildlife will use that. Uh, it is a native plant um, and it's just often, you know, pushed aside because humans react so poorly to it, but it, it has an important role in the environment. Understory trees, things like dog, dogwood, uh, redbud, and sourwood. Um, those trees are, you know, um, supported by canopy trees that provide shade for those um, specific trees. Shrubs and ground cover. Um, there's so many different plants that would not be able to survive without uh, the shade and support of trees. And trees also, you know, throughout their life cycle, as they die, they help enrich the soil and create a healthy network of fungi which um, a lot of other plants will rely on in various ways throughout their life cycle. Um, and so spice bush and sweet shrub, buckeye, those are great shrubs that have uh, resources for birds as well. Um, and there's plenty of ground covers. Pictured here is the red columbine, that beautiful flower in the middle of the slide, uh, which is another hummingbird plant. It blooms really early in the year. Uh, and so it's a nice um, 
early food source for uh, migrating ruby-throated hummingbirds here in the Atlanta area. And it's a plant that does well in the shade. I know a lot of us have shade and we're looking for plants that flower in the shade. Um, it does pretty well in the shade. Um, and it, I think you, you're best if you plant it near um, a sidewalk or something like that because uh, their soil requirements um, involve some, I think like limestone-based limestone uh, soil chemistry but it's a really neat plant. I have some and it's fantastic. All right, so another sort of um, uh, way that trees provide food for birds, um, and it's a way that most people don't really think of right away, is the leaf litter that our deciduous trees provide. And leaf litter is so, so critical um, for a healthy habitat for a bunch of wildlife. and. Um, it really is best if you leave the leaf litter beneath your trees uh, because it's going to enrich the soil. It's going to provide places for a bunch of different wintering insects um, to, to hang out and insects to live throughout the year. Uh, but really, during the wintertime, you'll see a lot of birds hanging out in the leaf litter because they're hunting for um, overwintering insects as a great protein source when food is, is not as abundant as in the summertime. Um, and then also that leaf litter plays a role as habitat for other animals that birds might be feeding on, other animals that are an important part of the food chain. So here you have a, a eastern redback salamander, um, which is, uh, you know, native to the Atlanta area and can be found all throughout the city. Um, and they are a species that thrives in that leaf litter layer of the forest. And so if you, you know, rake up your leaves and take them off your property, then uh, you're really losing a lot of opportunities for wildlife and, and birds and other animals to flourish. Um, so I'd encourage you to either leave it where it falls or rake it up and put it in your um, flower gardens or beds or in the backyard somewhere, because it really is a, a valuable resource and it's a part of the tree's life cycle and it's the way they support themselves and other animals. All right, so another way that trees provide food for birds is by, be, by being hosts to other insects and other wildlife. So a lot of our birds go after insects. Um, actually, it's like 95 or 96 percent of our birds um, rely on insects to feed their young. And so it's critical that there are a lot of trees that can host those insects. And um, here you have a hooded warbler with a caterpillar. Um, that it's probably going to take to feed uh, its, its nest, um, its, its um, fledglings, and, and uh, raise them up uh, nice and healthy. Uh, and then on the right, you have a red-shouldered hawk um, eating uh, some kind of lizard. I can't really tell from this photo. But, um, you know, trees provide places for lizards, chipmunks, squirrels, um, and so much more to thrive. And a lot of our birds are, are relying on those at some point. Um, whether it's as a predator or prey item. Um, more tree recommendations. You can take out your phone and take a picture of this one as well. So these are trees that are great host plants for a lot of um, caterpillar species. Uh, and so oaks are the number one um, host for caterpillar species. They host more caterpillar species than any of other of our native trees. Um, the cherry bark, that's supposed to say cherry bark oak, not cherry back oak. Uh, the cherry bark oak is, is one that we wanted to highlight for the tree's Atlanta sale, um, but they are also offering a variety of other oak species as well. Um, and so definitely get yourself an oak if you don't have one. Uh, there are certain bird species that are great um, to find on oaks, like certain warblers, like um, black and white warbler, for example. The white oak is, is uh, another great oak that both Georgia Audubon and Trees Atlanta are, are selling. Black cherry, we're going to have available at our fall sale this year, um, which is a great one and host to a lot of caterpillars. The sassafras, tulip poplar, spice bush, which is not technically a tree, but an, a fantastic plant that can do well in uh, part shade and shaded areas. And then hickory um, is another great tree. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're in the Piedmont region where the oak hickory forest is really the dominant um, forest and, and two of the most important trees. And so they're great to have in your habitat, in your yard, if, if you have the space um, for them. And here we have a picture of an American kestrel. 
It's a small falcon species that's native to uh, the southeast, native to uh, Georgia, and they have a pretty wide range across the U.S. and across the world, really. But um, here you can see it feeding uh, some caterpillar. It looks like a hornworm or something. I, I don't know my caterpillars that well, but uh, pretty neat to see. And there you go. Where's that nest? It's in a tree, a dead tree in particular. Um, so that's pretty neat. So why do trees need birds? We just spent a bunch of time talking about the importance of um, trees for birds, but why do birds need the trees? Or why do trees need the birds? <laughs> Tripping over my words. Um, well, first thing is seed dispersal. And with seed dispersal comes forest regeneration. Uh, both of those things are very, um, uh, or it's, it's really important to have birds um, for those things to happen. Uh, and then protection and pollination. Uh, so here we have uh, Eastern Bluebird on the left um, with a bunch of caterpillars once again to feed its young, uh, really showing the importance of having host plants for a variety of caterpillars um, to support our nesting birds. Uh, and then on the right, we have a tufted titmouse, which is a, a great example of a bird that spends a lot of time eating seeds um, and spreading those throughout the forest. Um, you know, a great bird that you'll probably often see at your seed feeder if you have one, but um, you know they are natural seed dispersers of the forest. So let's talk a little bit about seed dispersal in, in forest regeneration. Well, these three birds here are really great, great um, examples of, of birds that um, spend a lot of their time going back and forth um, and taking um, acorns and other seeds and caching them away. Um, and so these birds will take um, seeds and gather them throughout the summer and the fall and hide them in places so that they can go back and eat them later. Um, and they do this really heavily in the fall uh, to get ready for the winter. And the thing is, a lot of these birds are going and they're picking out the very best of the best when it comes to the acorns and the other seeds. And so they're picking the, the um, acorns that are going to be the most likely to germinate and turn into a healthy tree. And so the thing is, they spend a lot of time doing this, but they don't remember where every single um, acorn or seed is. And so that helps with forest regeneration. Um, and the thing is, a lot of our tree species um, aren't going to, they're, if they're dropping their um, seeds and their uh, acorns and everything right underneath them, that's not really the ideal place for most trees to grow. Uh, usually if they're farther away from the, the host or the parent tree, um, they're gonna do better because there's gonna be more sunlight. They're not gonna get shaded out. They don't have to compete with a tree that's already well-established. And so birds really play an important role in, in taking those and spreading those seeds um, around. And so here you have the green jay on the left, which is one of my favorite species of birds. It's not native to Georgia, but I wanted to include it anyway because I really like it. Here in Georgia, we have the blue jay, which is really, really uh, important bird when it comes to uh, forest regeneration, um, in particular with some of those oak species. And then in the middle, you have a red-bellied woodpecker, um, which also caches um, seeds and nuts. And then our other uh, native species of woodpecker that caches, um, seeds, and nuts is also on the slide, and it's in the Georgia Audubon logo. Um, that's a red-headed woodpecker. So not all birds, you know, cache seeds and, and um, hide them and go back to them. It's really some of the more intelligent birds, um, but only two of our seven woodpecker species um, do that, and that's the red-bellied woodpecker and the red-headed woodpecker. Both of them can be found in the Atlanta area, the red-bellied woodpecker being the more common of the two. And then on the right hand side, we have the American crow and both the American crow and fish crow, which are native to Georgia, um, will cache seeds and help regenerate forests. Um, yes, so the other, yeah, the other side of seed dispersal and forest generation, regeneration is, you know, birds that are eating fruit and spreading seeds that way. And so there are tons and tons of birds that do that. And a lot of them are those passerines, but there are so many more. Um, and by eating the seeds and um, pooping them out, going through the digestive system is actually really valuable for a lot of seeds because it helps scarify the seeds, um, which essentially um, wears away some of the layers of, of the seed and um, helps the seed get ready to germinate at the right time of year. Um, 
And then once again, they're spreading them, bringing them far away from the parent tree um, and increasing the likelihood that that um, seed will be able to germinate and uh, grow into a mature tree. Um, all right. Next thing is security protection. Uh, insects are one of the you know uh, largest issues that that a lot of different tree species face. Um, however, birds are the little security guards, uh, and they protect the trees by eating a lot of those insects, right? So on the left-hand side, we have a yellow-billed cuckoo, uh, which uh, spends a lot of time um, eating caterpillars, and particularly the, the tent caterpillars, which um, build those big webs in the tree. And there's tons and tons of the caterpillars at once. The yellow-billed cuckoo really likes to eat those. Then you have the black or the Carolina chickadee, uh, which is a great species of bird. And just that little tiny chickadee, which many of us are familiar with because they show up at feeders, um, they require 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to, to raise one brood of uh, chickadees. So that's like a couple hundred of cat hundreds of caterpillars every single day when they're raising their young. Uh, so they really spend so much time. And that's a really tiny bird. So imagine how much um, some of the larger birds uh, have to provide to um, um, raise their young. And so protection is a really important thing that birds provide for the trees. Pollination, our hummingbirds are great at this. And there are several species of trees that um, are pollinated by hummingbirds, buckeye, redbud, tulip poplar, black cherry, and maples, I believe. I'm not 100% sure about maples, but I think so. Um, here we have a picture of an Anna's hummingbird, very similar to a ruby-throated hummingbird that is our native to Georgia. Um, but I could only find a good picture of the Amos hummingbird. And you can see that awesome lichen um, nest and they build the nest and um, use spider webs to actually hold that nest together. And they do nest and build those nests oftentimes in mid-story trees, uh, usually around 15 to 20 feet off the ground is where our ruby-throated hummingbirds build their nests. And so once again, the trees are playing an important role for the hummingbird. Now I want to spend some time. Um, we have one hey. Yeah, let's do it. Question. Yeah. So um, just really quick, uh, just to make sure we encourage folks to ask questions if they have them. We had a couple questions come in through the Q&A. And it's the one of these is the ones that I commented at when I first saw your presentation, which is, what is that bird behind you yelling at us? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So this is for a warbler species. This is a Canada warbler. Uh, it's one of the more uncommon warblers that um, uh, makes its way through Georgia in the spring and they nest up in the mountains. So I took this photo up at Brasstown Bald um, in the mountains and so they are a, a, a species that yeah nests all the way in the mountains and they rely heavily on rhododendrons um, and some of those plants and uh, then they also eat a lot of insects so they're up in the trees looking for those insects too. Excellent thank you and then one more kind of going back to the leaf litter, which I'm so glad that you talked about the importance of leaf litter. And it, I'm reading the question, is it okay to put my neighbor's collected leaf litter under my trees, even though that tree is not in my yard? So is it okay to put oak tree leaves underneath a pine tree? Is there any problems that that could cause? Yeah, as far as I know, that would only be beneficial. Um, if there was any tiny, you know, issue with that, it's outweighed by the benefits, um, especially if you don't have any leaf litter and it's a deciduous tree that you're putting those leaves underneath. Um, so yeah, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, I can see there potentially if you're putting too much leaf litter, like piles and piles that could potentially um, be harmful, um, but definitely getting some leaf litter on the ground is going to be more beneficial than having nothing or little. And yeah, when, you know, in the fall, when the leaves are blowing around, those leaves go all over the place. So, so most trees, I, I doubt, would be affected by um, having a different species leaves underneath it. Awesome. Thank you. And just a reminder, folks, um, to continue to put up anything in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll also have some time at the end of the presentation for those. Thanks, Gabe. Yes. All right, so now, yeah, we're going to transition and talk a little bit about conservation side of things. So the conservation of trees and birds really go hand in hand. Um, and we're going to look at this through the bird lens. Uh, and so in 2019, a big study 
uh, was published in the science um, uh, publication in the science magazine. And uh, it talked about the decline of birds in North America and found that one in four birds are gone since 1970. So since 1970, the total um, population of birds in North America has decreased by about 3 billion birds, um, which is pretty scary. And Audubon also released a report saying about two thirds of North American birds are at increasing risk, risk of extinction from global temperature rise. So a lot of scary stuff coming at the birds. Um, and so uh, here are some graphics from that 3 billion birds study that came out in 2019. Eastern forest birds are, are really um, kind of uh, go hand in hand with what we see in Atlanta um, and many of our Piedmont forests. And so you can see they've decreased by 17%. Wood thrush is a species that you can um, find in the Atlanta area that breeds and has an absolutely amazing melodious song. And six and 10 have, have been, um, are gone since 1970. Migratory birds, including things like the Baltimore Oriole, which also come through the Atlanta area, are also decreasing. Aerial insectivores, uh, like chimney swifts um, and different swallows are also decreasing by about 32%. And grassland birds, although they are um, less directly connected to um, trees when it comes to habitat, although trees are really important in grasslands and for some nesting species, um, I wanted to include because they are decreasing most rapidly at about 53%. Um, so those are some of the graphics uh, highlighting some of those really um, disheartening declines. But within this study, they found four main results. So there's about 3 billion fewer birds um, even some of the common species are declining. The landscapes are losing their ability to support um, bird populations. And so we'll talk about that in a little. Uh, and the good news, the little silver linings, that conservation efforts have been linked to increases in populations. So woodpeckers, raptors, and waterfowl have all increased since, since the 70s. And those can be linked um, largely to specific conservation practices. So if we do uh, decide to take action, there's a good chance that we can um, make a difference when it comes to the declines that we're seeing. But what's causing these declines? Well, this study found that habitat loss and habitat degradation are really the two biggest causes. So not only are we losing habitat, but the habitat that we have is becoming less and less ecologically valuable. Um, and so there's a lot that we can do to, um, you know, uh, combat this, these changes and these, these issues. Um, and so we want to work on them. And, and obviously habitat when it comes to birds is the trees, right? Um, that's a, it's a very key component. And so we can work hand in hand to conserve birds and the forests that they live, many of them live in. So what can you do? Uh, first thing is plant native. So I, I mentioned that not only losing habitat, the habitat that we have is, is becoming less and less ecologically valuable. That largely is due to non-native invasive species that are, are coming and displacing our native trees. Um, you know, a lot of us use just ornamental plants in our landscaping, but by using native plants, you're allowing um, birds to um, use the full resource um, that these trees offer because our native trees are ones that are adapted to uh, support insects and support other wildlife. Um, and so it's important to use natives when you can. Protect living and dead trees. Um, so things like taking care of the trees and maintaining them, removing non-native invasive species, that's what NNIS is. Uh, legislation, Trees Atlanta has been heavily involved with the uh, Atlanta Tree Ordinance. So making sure that we're staying on top of that and making sure our trees are, our, our cities are prioritizing the health and, and, and well-being of our trees. Educate others. You can reduce your lawn and water use. Uh, lawns are really ecological deserts when it comes to wildlife and, and birds. And so replacing parts of your lawn with um, habitat can be really valuable. Create a wildlife sanctuary and learn more. So this is an infographic that you can see from the 3 billion bird study. So there's seven simple steps. Um, and providing habitat for birds is, is really one of the most important ones. And that comes in planting trees and other native plants. So now to talk a little bit more about the native plants. Um, like I said, they support functional and sustainable habitats and support the full circle of life. So if you have uh, native plants in your yard, you're gonna be able to allow birds to raise their young. The guy in the photo here is Doug Tallamy. He's a professor at, professor at the University of Delaware. He's an entomologist who studies bugs and their relationship to 
plants and birds and habitat. Um, and he found, or I think one of his master students found that um, your yard has to have 70% native plants to support one full brood of chickadees. So remember the chickadees were the ones that require 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one brood of, of young. Um, and so 70% um, native plants in your yard in order to support that full circle. Um, and that's really because those native plants, once again, they support the insects, unlike uh, many of our ornamental plants. Um, you know, ornamental plants can have some wildlife value, but there is no way that they're going to outshine our native plants because our native plants are the ones that have been here the longest and our insects know them extremely well. Um, if you plant native, um, you don't have to care for your um, yard as much because you really don't have to do much. They don't require watering. Um, and I say if done properly, because a lot of us get native plants and don't really know where to plant them, it's important that you plant them in the right place, um, in the right soil type and all of that. Um, you don't need pesticides to take care of those plants, the native plants, because your birds are going to take care of all those bugs for you. And if you do see, you know, native plants that have been eaten by insects, that's totally okay because we need the insects to feed the birds and other wildlife anyway. Once again, leave the leaves if you can, and then learn the non-native invasive plants. Um, some of the really common ones here in Atlanta are Chinese privet, wisteria, English ivy. Um, learning those basic ones are really helpful because you can start to remove those from your yard and provide more native habitat. The two books on the screen, you can take a picture of those. Those are both by Doug Tallamy and they're fantastic books that really go into detail about the importance of this relationship when it comes to native plants and birds and other wildlife. And Doug Tallamy also wrote a book recently that just came out about oak trees and how amazing oak trees are. So if you're a fan of oaks, or if you're not, you should get the book and read about them because uh, there's really some good stuff. Now this is probably my favorite slide in the whole presentation, protect living and dead trees. Um, so living trees, obviously planting them in the right places, um, and doing your best through legislation and education to, to keep them healthy. But really, trees throughout their whole life cycle are so valuable. Um, when a tree dies, when a part of a tree dies, that is just as valuable as a live tree and sometimes even more valuable. Um, so I always encourage people, if you have a dead tree in your yard, leave it, don't take it out. Unless it's a, gonna fall in the house or the car, um, then you obviously have to take it down. But even then, take that, that dead tree and use the wood in your property. Um, dead trees on the ground are almost as valuable as a dead tree standing because they provide hosts to a bunch of insects and then birds are going to be feeding on that other wildlife. They help enrich the soil and different fungi um, are going to feed on them. And that also helps enrich the soil and, and really create an abundance of life. Uh, when I go out birding, I always go and look for dead trees. That's the first place I'm looking because dead trees are really host to so much life. Um, and it's a lot easier to see the birds on a dead tree than a tree filled with a bunch of leaves. But uh, yeah, dead trees, like our cavity nesting birds are using those trees as well. Uh, trees, in, trees Atlanta has an awesome stumpery garden on the, I think it's the east side belt line um, in Reynoldstown. Uh, which is a garden that uses a bunch of dead trees and stumps. Uh, and you can find creative ways to use stumps in your yard. But if you have to take down a tree, if you can even leave like 10 feet or five feet of that stump or that trunk of the tree, that can be really valuable. And you could have birds nesting in, in that section of the tree. The only reason we really need bird houses um, these days is because we've spent so much time taking down our dead trees and removing them from the landscape. Um, Bird, bird nests and bird boxes or bird boxes are really, you know, a replacement of uh, a hollowed out tree. Um, so if you can leave those trees up, you're going to increase the wildlife in your yard. And it really shows the value of a tree throughout, you know, its entire life cycle. Even if it's dead, it's still providing so much life. And I think that's a really awesome thing. So now we have a slide, you know, to talk about the sanctuary program that Georgia Audubon has. And um, this is a great thing that you can do to kind of engage with your green space and increase uh, the value for wildlife in your, your space. So we have a program that you can get your backyard certified or a local park. Um, if you're involved with like the Friends Group or something there, here are some of our requirements. Uh, and you can go on our website to see the full requirements and learn more about the sanctuary program. Um, but you get one of our avian advocate volunteers to come and visit your property and um, give you feedback. 
Uh, and then you can get one of the signs that we have there if you get certified and we provide um, help and support throughout the whole process. And you can get as little as 50 square feet um, certified. So if you have an area that meets the requirements that's 50 square feet, um, and if that's all you can manage, that's totally fine. And that's what we um, would like you to apply for. Uh, so you can visit more, visit our website and, and learn more. And you can also collect other certifications. So there's a lot of other great organizations that have similar certifications, uh, like Georgia Native Plant Society has a native plant certification. There's a bunch of insect related ones and pollinator ones. Um, and yeah, so that's something I encourage you to check out. Uh, you can learn more. Uh, about sanctuaries through our virtual wildlife sanctuary tour, which we have an upcoming sanctuary tour in September that I'll touch on at the end of the presentation. But we had a virtual tour last year. We have these awesome videos. You can check them out on our YouTube page, but it talks about some of our certified sanctuaries and um, you can see what the landowners have done to um, kind of curate amazing native habitats in their own backyards. I'd also encourage you guys to visit your local green spaces and make sure that you're protecting them. So this is a photo from Fernbank Forest, Fernbank Forest, one of my um, favorite Atlanta green spaces. And uh, it really has an amazing um, uh, healthy forest with amazing trees. There's a bunch of champion trees. So some of the largest trees in Atlanta are found in the forest. And you can see, look at all that leaf litter on the ground. It's an important part of a healthy system. And now we're last couple of slides here before we get into questions. Um, a little bit about Georgia Audubon. If you're not familiar with our organization, our mission is to build places where birds and people thrive. And we do this through conservation, education, and community engagement. So we have a lot of awesome programs. Uh, we have free field trips um, throughout the year, and you can check those out on our website and show up to a field trip, even if you have no birding experience. Um, and we'll have someone, you know, help you out and show you how to look for birds and get you plugged into the, the community. It's really fun. Um, and then we also have a bunch of education programs that you can learn more about on our website. And, um, and yeah, we work with Trees Atlanta uh, quite a bit on a, different, a lot of different projects. So we're, we're excited to be partnering and we'd be happy to have you um, attend any of our events in the future. Now, a couple other resources that I wanna point out that are really helpful for um, learning more about birds and trees and ecology and all of that. First and foremost, Trees Atlanta and Georgia Audubon, our websites have a bunch of resources, so definitely check those out. We have like great blog posts, social media posts, all of that, so definitely get plugged in with those. At Georgia Audubon, you can become a master birder if you want to learn more about birds. It's a great um, program that gets you intensely, intensively involved with, with birding and um, learn, learning about how to identify birds. You can join us for free, free field trips, like I mentioned. You can also volunteer with us. There's a lot of opportunities. I mentioned specifically become an avian advocate. So that's for our wildlife sanctuary program. We rely on a lot um, of people who, who know their, their uh, plants. And so if you know your native plants and non-native invasive plants, then we'd encourage you to get involved with that program. You get to visit people's yards and help us certify different properties and help landowners learn more about what they can do to make their space better. Audubon's Plants for Birds Native Plant Database. So National Audubon um, has a website and their uh, Plants for Birds um, page uh, allows you to put in the zip code and then there's a, it generates a bunch of native plants that you can match with different bird species. And so that's a fun tool to check out um, if you wanna look at what plants might be um, good for certain bird species in your particular area. The National Communities of Georgia. This is the book that's pictured here. I highly encourage you to check out this book if you want to learn more about Georgia and the systems and ecology and, and everything. It's a fantastic resource. Georgia Native Plant Society. I, I always like to shout out because they do some great work and uh, have a lot of great resources on the website and a lot of um, great events and everything to learn more about natives. iNaturalist and Seek are both um, apps that help you identify things in your space. Um, and so they're really fantastic. I encourage people to get involved. iNaturalist is like a community science uh, website. So when you submit photos and stuff, uh, people help you identify what you're looking at. And then that is used by scientists um, for different studies. eBird is a huge, amazing um, resource for people who are, are learning about birds or people who are heavily involved with birding. So eBird, the website is filled with a bunch of information on birds. And essentially, it, it was created for birders to submit checklists and keep track of the birds that they see over time. And um, 
Ebert takes the information that people are providing in the checklists that they submit and uses that to study bird populations over time. Uh, and it's an amazing resource. There's quizzes you can take to learn more about birds. It's one of the ways I started to learn to identify birds in my area. Um, it's a really, really great resource. Lastly, we have um, some Georgia Audubon specific um, resources. This one touches on native um, plants and the birds that they attract. And this can be found on our website under our sanctuary page in the resources section. And then this resource also is in that same place on Georgia Audubon's website. And this is talks about different plants that are good for tricky urban spaces. So if you're planting, um, you know, in an area that doesn't have a bunch of open habitat and things like that, and it's a tricky spot, then this is a good resource for checking that out. Okay, the last slide I have is just to shout out some events that we have upcoming. So September is Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month, declared by the governor. This is the fourth year that it's been Georgia um, Grows Native for Birds Month in September, and we have a bunch of awesome events that are coming up. First and foremost, our native plant sale, which opens September 1st um, and closes the 19th. That's uh, online. You, you can buy plants, and then there's a pickup on the 26th. At our Atlanta location, we also have a pickup on the 25th in Athens, if that's closer to where you are. Um, we have the Mayoral Forum, which is really important for anybody involved in green spaces in Atlanta, where the different uh, candidates are going to be talking about their um, thoughts on green spaces in Atlanta and preserving them and whatnot. Um, so that's September 8th from 6 to 8, and it's free. We have then two um, really amazing talks by two amazing women. Um, that are going to be happening on the 26th and the 16th. So Dr. Leslie Edwards is actually one of the people who wrote that book that I was talking about on the previous slide. Um, and so she's an incredible wealth of knowledge, and you should definitely uh, sign up for that. Um, and then the Wildlife Sanctuary Tour, which I referenced uh, earlier. Um, and you can see all of these events are going to be in a virtual, um, except for the pickups for the native plant sale. Uh, so you can enjoy these all from, you know, your home. Um, and George Ann Schmalz also is uh, an incredible birder. And she worked at Fernbank Science Center for a very long time and was the ornithologist there. And she's an incredible wealth of knowledge, too. And then last but not least, the Trees Atlanta sale. There's so many amazing plants that are going to be offered in, in the sale. I got to check out the list of availability. And there's so many awesome trees. And Rebecca can go ahead and give some more details on the, the Trees Atlanta sale that's going to be in October. Yeah, first, um, thank you, Gabe. This was amazing. Um, I do have a few more questions that we'll get to, but just so folks um, have the details on the Trees Atlanta plant sale, we will be doing pre-orders online starting September 3rd and running through the 20th of September. Our pre-sale pickup will be September 25th and 26th at Murphy Crossing. However, we'll also have an in-person sale on Saturday, October 2nd uh, at the Freedom Far Farmers Market. So that's also another opportunity um, to kind of see what, what we have available, what you can pick up and continue to transform your yard into my favorite phrase of the evening, which is an ecologically valuable yard. And uh, that's, I think, so many opportunities, especially with Georgia Audubon's um, big September month uh, ahead of us. So thank you, Gabe. I do want to get to a couple of the questions, which you did kind of answer a, a little bit of, but a couple follow-ups. Someone had asked about the yard certification process, and I think you gave a, a lot of good information on it. There was kind of a question of, is there a certification for a neighborhood, or is it really focused on just one homeowner? It's a great question. Uh, right now, it's really just focused on one homeowner. However, um, we're currently working on, you know, potentially uh, having a new certification or designation for oddball spaces like um, communities and uh, just different green spaces that don't really fit the mold of a typical house. Um, I would say if you're interested in something like that, shoot me an email and I can connect you with our sanctuary program manager. Um, and we can have a discussion about what your green space looks like and, you know, the potential of that. Because historically, the program has evolved quite a bit. Um, it was, you know, volunteer run, and we have all sorts of green spaces that are certified, but the program is definitely built um, for residential properties mostly. But we, we are happy to consider other spaces. And like I said, in the future, we might have a program that is more fitting for that type of space. 
Great, thank you. And I think this will also be covered in one of the events that you're hosting in September, but it was kind of, are there some good examples around Atlanta to see what a 70% plus native species yard looks like? Yeah, I, I definitely say our, our sanctuary um, tour is the best way to do that. So historically we did the tour in person, which was a lot of fun. Obviously the last um, two years now, well, last year we did it virtually and we liked it so much that we decided to do it again virtually this year. Um, so check out those videos on our YouTube page. And then if you are able to attend this upcoming um, sanctuary tour, which the information is, let's see, right here. Um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and also I always tell people, you know, go to some of your local green spaces and check them out and see what they're like. Um, because if you can emulate some of those green spaces in your backyard, um, usually that's a good step in the right direction. A lot of our green spaces do have issues when it comes to non-native invasive species, um, but they have a lot of good things going on as well. And, you know, us and organizations like Trees Atlanta are working to, um, you know, remove non-native invasive species and um, create more enriched and healthy ecological systems when it comes to our green spaces. So we do a lot of work at Deep Dean, um, which is one, you know, Atlanta green space. We have other spaces we worked in, like Cascade Springs Nature Preserve, um, along the, um, uh, what's it called, Big Creek Greenway in Alpharetta. Uh, so all sorts of spaces. There's so many great areas, but yeah, check out the Sanctuary Tour stuff. Check out our YouTube um, videos from last year, and that'll get you a good, good start of what that looks like. Thank you. And I know we're a little bit over. I'm going to try to get this one in. Um, it's a little bit, I'm reading it. Uh, I have a bird feeder on my apartment balcony, top floor away from the window that gets used daily by about a dozen or so birds. Just curious, do birds get accustomed to rely on a food source? Meaning if after two something years of the birds getting used to eating from my feeder every day, will, will there be any issues when I move and take the feeder? There's also two hummingbirds that feed from my balcony flower bed every day. The birds that use the feeder are finches, sparrows, doves, cardinals. That's awesome. I love that so much. And I can totally relate because I um, live in an apartment where I just have a balcony to work with. And I, I, there's so much you can do with such a small space when it comes to um, plants and feeders and all of that. And definitely using native plants is, is a way to go there. But um, yes, birds do get a little accustomed to, to um, you know, the feeders and stuff in that they will um, include that in kind of their daily routine. Uh, like a lot of times you'll have the same hummingbird coming uh, to your feeder at certain times. Now, throughout the year, that definitely changes because the hummingbirds are migratory and a lot of other bird species are. Um, however, I would not be worried about, um, you know, you moving and moving those feeders because there's plenty of other feeders in the area and plenty of other food sources for those birds to rely on. Um, so none of those birds are going to be solely relying on the food that you provide. Like hummingbirds, for example, usually have a network of several feeders that they're going to, as well as, you know, just native plants that they're going to be feeding on to. Excellent. And last one, um, this is bigger than this conversation for sure. Um, it was, have you ever gone to tree companies and educated them to encourage folks to leave part of the main trunk when removing trees? I have not, but that is a great idea. And that's definitely something that I've thought about. And um, more and more, we've been thinking about, yeah, trying to do stuff to educate landscape, landscaping companies, you know, about leaving leaves or reusing leaves um, and tree companies. The, the issue is a lot of times, you know, those companies and businesses get more money when they do that extra bit of work. Um, so it can be difficult in that regard. Um, so we, you know, focus on educating the landowners because they're the ones that get to make those decisions um, for the most part, but that is a fantastic idea and that's something I do want to look into further um, because it really would be great if, if more people and um, uh, landscapers and arborists and stuff practiced that. And I would just follow up with that and, and saying when you're looking at tree companies, make sure you're, you're looking for those that are certified arborists. They know, you know, they're, they're reputable and um, 
they kind of know what they're they're doing with the the tree health and what the owner wants. So I think Gabe's right on with you know educating each other about leaving those those dead standing trees for sure. Um, Thank you so much, Gabe, uh, for being here with us. It's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. I hope you all have as well. Please join us again um, for lots of upcoming programs. Make sure you've made a note of all of those upcoming Audubon programs uh, that are coming up in the month of September. To close out uh, next week, I know Gabe mentioned that Fernbank Forest is one of his favorite places. Next Thursday, we'll be having Peter Essek, who did a photo um, collection book of photos of Fernbank Forest, another virtual program. So if you want to see some of the beauty and you haven't been out lately, you might want to join in on that. And uh, Eli will be there as well to talk about from the ecological standpoint of the forest. So it might be something you might want to check out. Anything else, Gabe? I would say um, thank you to everyone for attending and you have my email address there. Uh, if anybody is interested in asking more specific questions um, about any of the things that we talked about. And yeah, it was a pleasure to be here and I'm always happy to, to talk trees and birds and learn more. Um, so thank you for having me. Awesome, thanks Gabe. And thank you all so much for attending and learning more about the importance of trees and birds in our ecosystem. Thank you, have a great evening.